from? It's not going to reach me. Hello, thank you so much for coming to the United Palace.
because one, many people would not even consider an art, but people who do wrestling do, and they would definitely say it's the lowest form of art versus what other people may call the highest art. Yet you have performers in both of them, artists in both of them, that are really putting their bodies um, in front of their art or as part of their art, and they age out. And there's just a lot of similarities bet between the two things. I think actually any athlete can relate to it. Uh, Except for maybe like pool players or something like that. <laughs> but I think it's her too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I learned so much. I, just even watching it, if you ever go see Swan Lake at the ballet, it's, it's very abstract and there's so many different interpretations because it can be, the music can be spun so many different ways. I remember as I was doing research over like the seven or eight years that it took to put the script together. I, I tried to see every performance I could, and I even I even got to um, the Bolshoi in Russia and saw a performance there, and there was a happy ending. The Russians put a happy ending at the end of the school break, and I was like, what? It made no sense. So it's like, well, we're not going to use that for sure. Uh, so that, that, that was always interesting, and, and I kind of like how Mark Heyman, the writer of this, really came up with an interpretation of the material that worked this kind of idea of losing your identity and of yourself, and it really worked well. Yeah, um, we, we were sitting up there watching with, um, we, we share an editor. Andy Weissman. And the great Andy Weissman, who edited this film yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Andy. Yeah. And he also had an attempted boom for me. Um, and I, I, I can't imagine the rehearsal that went into um, You've Got It two lead actresses, really, with Mila and Natalie, who are not professional dancers. Like, how much rehearsal time before the camera even starts? There's a lot. Well, Nat Natalie and I talked about this, I think, eight to ten years before we ever shot. Um, she had studied ballet. I was interested in ballet. We went to a early rehearsal of New York City Ballet and sat in the audience and talked about it. And but it just took a long time to kind of come together and figure it out. But as it started to gel, she took it very seriously and started studying. So I think she studied for a couple of years. Um, Mila, not so much. <laughs> kind of in the script. She's not perfect, <laughs> exactly. but she's passionate. She, you know, she did some time. She, she did, she did uh, like I'm sure she oh, did six means. months. Yeah, she did a lot of work. Um, but. Uh, it was a it was a lot of work, and it, it's a, it's an illusion of many things. Like there was a bit of a controversy at some point about it, but like Natalie did so much of the work. Um, when you get to like um, wide shots, there was some face replacement, but a very minimal amount because it's nearly impossible unless you do twenty years as a dancer to actually be built the way and to move the way they, they do. Well, so much of the film is framed just really tightly on the back of her head. I mean, like, from walking to Lincoln Center, which you don't have permission to go to, to those tight shots of her rehearsing, and we're almost experiencing Swamp Lake in the first person in a lot of our rehearsals. You know, to the point where, when Mila's like, get a drink, I'm like, I want to buy, everyone in the audience wants to buy this one <laughs> beer so badly. Because it feels like the world does not exist outside. I mean, it, it really, it, it really makes us all very comfortable. Like, yeah. It was, it was a challenge of how to shoot, shoot it because um, when, like when up, leading up to that, my first three films were very formal. Uh, probably like the most was The Fountain where every shot was storyboarded on a dolly and very deeply considered. But when I started working on The Wrestler, I, I suddenly had this happen with Mickey Rourke who was this genius but really was completely unpredictable and I did not want to stick him in any box. So I started, I came up, I went back to like my school, my film school days of picking up a camera and doing documentary and trying to make like a documentary of Mickey Rourke playing Randy the Ram in this movie. And that's sort of what that became. But when it came to Black Swan, we, we thought about it for a while, should we shoot it again in 16, handheld? But I couldn't think of a horror film that was shot handheld because I, I was worried that the audience would think of the camera person and be brought out of the fear because you kind of need a very kind of hidden camera. But if, if you have a camera that's moving, then it makes you think, oh, there must be a person behind it. So it was a bit of a gamble to see if we could 
pull it off. But what it did allow us is instead of shooting theater like from the front and from the sides, of really getting in there with the actors and dancing with the actors. Yeah, it's like you're physically trying to get inside her head. So that by the time we're in Swan Lake, like we totally accept the vocabulary. Yeah. Uh, of the film, to the point where, there's a point where she walked into her apartment and I just said to Andy, please no more mirrors. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> you never know what's going to come out of a mirror in this movie. Yeah, it's funny because Andy, Andy would say the same thing, please no more mirrors, because every time there was a mirror, there was the reflection of the camera. And so all those, it was always visual effect, he's like, oh, please no more mirrors. And mirrors. <laughs> Can't erase you one more time. And, you know, the, I think the handheld works beautifully, and, and I, I think it's so interesting that you say your previous movies were very storyboarded and on this one you had to let go, because that is exactly what Natalie Portman's character has to, she has to stop thinking of it as perfect and she has to let go. Um, when it came to those, you know, that, that big sequence, I mean, the sequence where she lets out her, her inner Mila Kunis and she takes her out into the world, um, and that sequence where she comes back home with her, or does she? <laughs> uh, how care, I mean, that's, that's really Tyler Durden levels of care in terms of how much is real, how much is, you know, what were the conversations in terms of that stuff? I really don't remember, but I'll make something up for you. Uh, I, I think there is a lot of thought behind the camera moves. Uh, there, we were kind of dancing with the actors, even when she would come in. The, the, I noticed one scene, she comes in the door, the camera spins around to get the mom, she hugs her mom to cry, and I remember like uh, choreographing it with the actors, and there was a lot of that. We always wanted to walk that line of, did it really happen? I mean, it's in the script when she comes back, and Mila Kunis' character makes fun of her for fantasizing about her. So. We always knew there had to be ambiguity, but how the mirror would pick up reflections was something you figured out on site. You got up, you framed up, and you're like, well, you know what, go back another inch, Mila, because then you slide out of the frame and just move a little slower so the audience feels it's intentional. So it's, it's really like, it's kind of, I think, um, having watched choreographer's work, and I know you've done this, is you start off with a real idea, but when they get into a three-dimensional space and you're dealing with real three-dimensional actors and, and objects, you have to improvise, you have to be open to what's revealing itself in front of you and, and jump on the things that are cool and that look great. Yeah, talk, talk about your choreographer for a bit. How, how early was he in the process? Benjamin, yeah. Benjamin Milipay. Milipay, that's a new film, actually. Carmen is out. I haven't seen it finished, I saw an early cut, which was great, um, but it's out now at the Angelica somewhere on the Upper West Side. Um, but Benjamin came on early, and Benjamin was one of the few people in the ballet world that was interested in helping us and actually opened up a lot of doors for us because he was a principal dancer at the New York City Ballet at the time. And it was a lot of fun. I, I wanted him to have a foot in the classical ballet so it was recognizable, but to update it with some animal, energy yeah. and so uh, he did that beautifully and then it was fun to then bring the camera operator in and start to dance with the dancers and he would also have to figure out how everyone was uh, bumping into each other type of stuff yeah. um, so there was a lot of movement in that way um, we, we you know Benjamin went on to marry Natalie Portman they have a family together the, the choreographer depicted on screen in the movie is a very different uh, energy, um, and, to, to put it mildly, um, but you know, the, the, the abuse and the, the sexual forwardness um, and inappropriateness um, of this teacher, it's, it's so accepted in the world of the movie. I, I, I'm curious what the conversations... Uh, if you do any, any kind of easy dig into ballet, it's all over the place. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, to the point where the mother refers to it. Yeah, know? I think it's, it was completely part of the language and part of the reality of that world. I, I haven't been in touch that deeply. I'm hoping that the world has changed for those dancers as well, but it was like a shadow that was hanging over that whole world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, talk a little bit about Winona Ryder, who I think is the most incredible casting. For the aging little princess. Um, you know, yeah, what, what was 
it like? I mean, uh, it was amazing. Uh, it, it was like everyone here. She's a legend, and so I was terrified. <laughs> every every moment with her was was great. She was incredibly present, sweet, and she was generous. It's a hard role to, for an actor to play an artist passing the baton. Um, I'm sure she was aware of it. We never really had conversations about it. I'm glad Stranger Things came out and her career was boom. Yeah, so, um, you know, the great actors, they, they never die. They just sort of take holiday for a little bit or something. Um, but so it's great to have her back. And it, it, she was just an utter professional and totally game for everything. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about body horror. <laughs> I mean, there's some genuine, just like old school horror movie scares in this, like a shadow passes across the back of the screen. And then there's like pulling your fingernail right up to the knuckle, um, which made me hide in my sweater uh, up in the orchestra. Your people did. Yeah. Um, why do you like to torture us so? Because I saw Requiem for a Dream, too. Uh, Requiem for a Dream, it makes sense. <laughs> Like, it, it seems like a, a tough vision to sell. 
it was incredibly difficult. It, after we did The Wrestler, which was a super low budget movie, and it did pretty well, then I had Mila and Natalie and Vincent Cassell, and I couldn't get the money. Every single studio passed on it. Wow. I remember one. It's all Tchaikovsky, right? It's not. It's, oh. it's a blend of Tchaikovsky and Clint Mansell. And yes! And, and, yeah. and there's a lot, we, 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 we recorded all the cues ourselves, but Clint went in there and surgically moved stuff around. But I, I remember, um, I don't know if you know Matthew uh, Bourne, who did the short old male swan lake, he was like, oh, that's a, you didn't really have to do all the pieces in order, but actually, there's not one piece of the swan lake ballet out of order. It's all like wow. in the right way, because I felt like I wanted the piece itself to feel like. And then Andy whispered to me, even the club is like rearranged swan lake. Yeah, like, we had Chemical Brothers, I think, come in and I was we like, did a okay, Chemical this, Brothers remix. Yeah, it's like, remix this part of Chicago. But, um, yeah, so, I forgot the question. No, no, we just, I don't know, it's just this, this sort of hermetically sealed world that we create that's all in our mind is really, because we're just, we're in there with her. Thank that's you, it. thank you. It's fun to, I mean, that's the beauty of movies, um, is that you can show that inner monologue. It's much more difficult. I guess in musicals you can have soliloquies, songs alone, but in most theater it's really hard to get into someone's head, um, but movies you can have someone staring in the mirror and you can figure out everything they're thinking about. Speaking of musicals, I heard a rumor about Black Swan the musical. Yeah. I don't know what you can tell us or can't tell us. There's definitely rumblings, like I, I, I can't really talk that much about it. I thought it was a, a totally ridiculous idea. And then, um, I should, actually, I should, I should, I should, I should heard some music written for it. I'll tell you about who later. I don't know if it's okay, great. And it was, and it was, and it was awesome. It was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few songs in that that were just like, oh wow, this really should get made. And there's interesting core. Everything. It's a lot of interesting people are coming around it. So who knows? If they have. But you know how hard they are to do. So a little bit. Yeah. So, <laughs> a little bit. Of the same. I actually have no idea. Just wow, that's hard. So well, it takes a long time. Well, this movie is a spectacular accomplishment. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.